Thanks for the introduction and thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, Michael and I walked around here yesterday and we said this is so much nicer than mm -hmm. NYU and Cornell where we're going to school. <laughs> uh, this is a lovely space and it's so nice to see you all here. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so this is the name of a paper that uh, is at ESA that Michael presented on yesterday. And I think like 15 minutes wasn't enough to get the background and do it justice. So this is nice because we can uh, talk about a lot about the prior work that gets us to the point. And then at the end, I'll like, candidate the down our results. Um, this is Michael who it's with. And then I think Shelby was here in February and met a lot of people. So there are some people yesterday and they're like, oh, you're Shelby students. And I was like, wow, that's cool that like, they came all the way to Amsterdam and that's what I've <laughs> done. I thought that was very nice. Okay, so I'll jump in. Um, so today we'll talk about several things. First, I want to formulate the problem that we're interested in, which is evaluating a Boolean function on the quantum computer. Uh, we'll start by giving a lower bound for this problem using the quantum adversary dual technique. And I'll just say that this is an SDP. If you take the dual of this SDP, you get another SDP. And from that SDP, you can get a quantum algorithm. Uh, all of this has been known before and is, I think, very cool context. Uh, and then the new stuff that we worked on was actually how to solve this SDP in practice to get a solution which you can turn into a quantum algorithm. Uh, and I wrote some, or we wrote some code actually a while ago for this problem. So I want to like demonstrate some of that and I hope that it will be useful uh, if you're interested in this type of problem. And then the last thing I'll do is just wave at some of the uh, theoretical result, results we had in the paper. Um, cool, so I will start. The problem that we're interested in is Boolean function evaluation, uh, which means that we're given a Boolean function f. This maps from bit strings of length n to 0 to 1. Uh, we're going to say that it maps from the subset of these bit strings, like the s, because sometimes we only care about some of these strings as opposed to all of them. And our goal is to do some pre-processing with f so that we can evaluate f of x efficiently for an unknown x. And efficiently here means that we're using a few queries. Uh, here is a classical example of this problem. Let's say that f of x is the OR function, which is x1 or x2 all the way up to xn. And on a particular bit string, x equals 0, 1, 1, a bunch of other bits, 0 we could have some strategy for evaluating this. And here queries look like we just randomly access different bits of our bit string. So let's say we access bit x1, which in this case is zero. That doesn't tell us the value of the function, so we need to keep going. Let's say then we access xn, which is the last bit of our function. That's also zero. It doesn't tell us the value of the function. And we go until we next text is test x3 and we get lucky this is a one we know the value of our function and then we can stop in the worst case of course uh, if your bit string only has one one in it and you get unlucky or it only has zeros you have to test every single one of the bits to check it so we'd say the query the classical query complexity of evaluating the or function is n I also want to highlight that this problem is like the decision problem of search. So if we're looking for some sort of marked element, we're just checking each thing and we're saying, is it the marked element or not? Is it zero or one? Uh, so actually, if we get a lower bound for evaluating f of x or evaluating the or function here, that gives us a lower bound for the search problem or research. Uh, I, I think I say that on the next slide. OK, so uh, everyone here is familiar with quantum stuff, I guess. Uh, cool. OK, uh, so we're assuming the query, the quantum like query model. Uh, that means that we have a query oracle for input x, which is just some unitary OX that we apply to a register uh, with here. I'm using this to mean the dimension that I'm in, not the number of qubits, the number of qubits as long as I don't know if that's a standard way of doing it or not. I couldn't find that. OK, but that, that's what I mean here. Um, this encodes the bit that I'm interested in, which is one of n, and then this is just a binary value, which is zero or one. And I pick up a minus one phase if these are not the same thing, uh, and a one phase if they are. So that's the Oracle model. And then so the, what, is, what is the B doing there? It seems like you just do a Z gate on the B qubit uh, without any interaction with X. Without inter any interaction on X. 
Here it is. This is xi. So it's the i. The, right, but you can factor this, right? It's like minus one to the xi times cat i times minus, minus one. one to the b cat b. So the b has no interaction with the, the relevant part of the state. B doesn't have interaction with the relevant part of the state. Um, if the idea is that this B is a control bit, then, yes. then you want, I think, to multiply the exponent rather than head. Would you explain that? Because that, I think, is how it was written, but I was getting confused because that would mean that this is a... So if they're the same thing, if they're both one, and I multiply it, then I get out of one. So this is like doing the XOR on the query, right? Uh -huh. If I'm multiplying them, but is your goal here that B functions like a control bit that determines whether the phase is applied or not? I think I just want to pick up a minus one phase if B is the same as X I, or sorry, if they're different. Uh -huh. And if they're the same, I want to pick up a one phase. So it's minus one if they're different, one if they're the same. Right. That... Your, your resulting state is a tensor product of minus one to the XI times cat I. Yes. And then minus one to the to the B. Times okay, they're just saying that could be factored. Yeah, so it's like okay. applying a Z gate to the to the B qubit, which seems not to be very relevant for the query setting. Okay, I think you're right, and thank you. This is how it was written in the notes that I was referring to, and I got two things, but okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent chat. Keep me honest. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, cool. Uh, so this this is the quantum model. Uh, hopefully, I haven't made this mistake anywhere else. Okay, and our goal is to lower bound the query complexity here. So for a given function f, we want to lower bound the number of queries that we need to make uh, on the worst case input to f in order to evaluate f of x. And Functions would still be massively complex, right? Yes, yep. Here, I'm not saying hard. Uh, well, here, I, I like, I'm just fixing what it's mapping from it to. So I'm not saying anything about how difficult it is to actually evaluate it. For right now, it's just for any Boolean function f. Uh, notice that if I consider f to be the or function, then this, if I can lower bound the query complexity of evaluating or then I get a lower bound on Go or search because this is the decision problem of uh, search here, which is pretty cool. So that just by, from this analysis, we get a lower bound of Go or search that so will fall out of it. Um, okay, awesome. So let's jump, any questions about the setup? Anything else then? Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, so the lower bound, we're going to assume that a quantum algorithm alternates, or I guess all quantum algorithms do, it alternates an input independent and an input dependent unitaries from some starting quantum state. So here, this is our, ooh, this is our starting quantum state, psi zero. I'm going to apply something that depends on our particular input OX and then some other unitary U. And then I'll repeat this some number of times. And I'll say that each time that I apply this, this is a query that I'm making to the oracle of x. And the question that we're interested in here is how much information can we get per query? Uh, and we wanna like say that we can't get too much information per query, so we need to make a lot of queries in order to evaluate the function. That's the like where we're going here. So we're gonna consider x and y in our input s that our like Boolean function takes, where f of x is not equal to f of y. We know two things here. First off, that the starting state psi 0x and psi 0y are the same because we haven't gotten any information about the particular input yet. The second thing we know is that psi tx and psi ty have to be far away from each other in order for us to be able to differentiate um, f of x, or like differentiate between these two values and correctly evaluate f of x and f of y. In particular, we need that the absolute value of uh, their inner product is less than or equal to two times the square root of epsilon times one times epsilon. Um, you, the, you can show this in some textbook. It, it shows up in a lot of textbooks, but it makes sense. We just need them to be far apart from each other so that when we do a measurement, we have the ability to differentiate them. Uh, and this epsilon here means that we'll succeed with probability of one minus epsilon in differentiating them. Okay, 
So for the purposes of this analysis, we're going to consider this adversary matrix that we're just going to construct. And I'm just going to tell you what this thing is. And then we're going to argue that it needs to have several properties about it. And then based on those properties, we're going to get this lower bound. So let gamma be uh, this matrix, which is defined on the real numbers. And the dimensions of it are the size of the inputs at S by the size of the inputs at S. So this is the matrix over here. Each one of the rows and columns, I'm going to um, assign each one of them to one of the inputs, X and Y. So Y is one of the inputs in S, and X is one of the inputs in S. And this is going to correspond to some, like it's going to index into this matrix. So for example, this is the like Y column and or Y row, and this would be the Y column. Uh, there are two properties that are, I'm going to say gamma has. The first is that it's symmetric. So gamma xy is equal to gamma yx. And the second property is that if f of x is equal to f of y, then the corresponding entries are zero. So in some sense, this matrix captures like the differences between our inputs and the work that I'll need to do to be able to distinguish them. Based on this matrix, uh, I'm also going to Sorry, let me move this over here. I'm going to also say that A is the principal eigenvector of this matrix. So it's the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. And I'm going to similarly index into its entries. So there's going to be entries corresponding to input Y and input X. Using this, I'll define some uh, weight function, Wj which is going to be the outer product of, or it's going to be A transpose gamma A which if I look at each term in this is going to be the sum over the X and Y's in S of the corresponding entry gamma XY, and then the entry AX and the entry AY times the inner product of psi JX and psi JY. And this is the state after J calls on input Y. So I've run, um, I've applied OX and U J times so far to get here. This is just some function that I'm defining. It, like. I don't, I don't have intuition about what this would mean independently of this process, but we're gonna argue several things about this function. The first one is that, the first thing that we'll argue is that W0 is big. So this quantity starts off quite large before we've done any applications of our unitaries. The second one is that for T to, if we run this whole thing T times, or if we make T, T queries here, then for t to for us to be able to differentiate between x and y with high probability, where f of x is not equal to f of y, we need this quantity wt to be small. And then the third thing we're going to argue is that wj plus 1 and wj are close for all intermediate values of j. So we start off with a big quantity, we end up with a small quantity, and at each step, we can't change very much as we go down. So these three things together will tell us that we need to make a lot of queries because we need to go from something that's big to something that's small, and each step doesn't help us very much. Can I interrupt? Yeah, please. Uh, are we allowed to ask questions to other people? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm also curious about the intuition behind. Like I, I understand that we are defining an object and that has like that ha respects these properties. But I also don't see the intuition of defining that particular object. And I was hoping someone helps. <laughs> you mean like why gamma is specifically this? No, no, no. The WJ itself, uh, like the, oh. the, the whole thing, like the principal eigenvector and the inner product, like I just don't see. Like I don't see how someone came up with that uh, either. Okay. I think hopefully I'll shed some light. Okay. I to be fair, I also I think it's very impressive <laughs> yeah. too. I think that like in some sense, this is the fact that this isn't it is very natural because we know that this will start off as one when j equals zero because they're the same state. And at the end, this has to be very small. Yeah, that I see, but like the there is this principal icon vectors values that we are using. Right. And this relation with the gamma adversary matrix. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of, I won't show this part, but there, there's a lot of linear algebra that goes here in here, and it requires like bounding all these Frobenius norms and spectral norms of the matrix. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand what the strategy is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> okay. The, uh, it, it, it's the principal eigenvector of, of, of gamma, right? Or what is it the principal eigenvector of? Yes, of okay, gamma. Okay, thanks. I think in the in the weight function of multiplicative adversary matrices, you at least lose the principal eigenvector. But I don't know if that makes it more natural because you still have this. this but gamma that you eigen. can push it in the gamma, I guess, in some sense, right? Or uh, like uh, because yeah. you have control over like constructing your own gammas. Yeah. So okay. Anyway, uh, it's. Sorry. <laughs> no, great question. Please, thank you. Yeah, that makes this more fun. I would love to engage, and I really appreciate this question. There's an answer, maybe you can see. No, I would say you can interpret W and XY as gamma XY. So Sandler says in the, uh, ah, so this is if your gamma is restricted to positive weights, you can interpret this, this uh, weight index. So I guess this uh, is, gamma x y a x a y as a probability distribution over input pairs x y uh, as long as your gamma is kind of normalized but you lose this intuition when you go to negative, the negative weights i see i see okay oh that, that helps yes thanks what is the probability distribution what is that so if um like what things are more probable then? No, I, I think it would, okay, I'm not sure, but I think it would be like, if your adversary was basically choosing what input it would ask you to compute over some probability distribution, then this might be capturing that is the correct one. Well, you, you could fold the gamma and the, the A vectors into one weight function on pairs. And if everything is non-negative, you can just make sure that the sum of the weights is one, and then you have a probability distribution of the pairs. Yeah. And the idea is to give more weights to x, y pairs that are somewhat harder to distinguish. Yes. But yeah. indeed, this, this intuition disappears if gamma could have negative entries. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let's go through these three steps of our strategy. I'll, I'll kind of hand wave at them because a few of them are hard. So if W is zero, uh, we want to show that this is big. It starts off as a large value. It's just equal to this, uh, but we know that these are the same state before the first query because we haven't learned anything about our particular input. So this has to, the inner product has to be one. Uh, if we take this, then this is just the spectral norm of gamma. Similarly, if WT is small, this means that for all x and y such that f of x is not equal to f of y, we need the absolute value of their inner product to be the small constant. Uh, so the absolute value of wt is going to be less than or equal to the sum here. I'm assuming that we are in the positive case. You can show the same thing with more work in the negative case, um, but you'd like bound the Frobenius norms, and I could like I could have just stated the claim and then showed it to you, but that wouldn't have been very satisfying and like. Yeah, so I did this instead, um, but I can direct you to notes if you want to see this that I think are quite accessible. Uh, notice here that already by the definition of gamma xy, if f of x is equal to fy, this value is already zero. So we can just say that this thing is equal, like the, this inner product is equal to two epsilon one minus epsilon. And in the case where f of x is equal to f of y, this term is already zero because of this. Uh, Terry, can I just ask you? Can you can assume that the gammas, uh, gamma entries are non-negative, but you your your a is a principal eigenvector, right? So can it could that not have negative entries? I think we also know that it has to be positive. Oh, I see. It's but on Frobenius theorem or something. Yes, I see. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so you just factor this out, and you also get the spectral norm of gamma, but now it's multiplied by the small epsilon factor. Okay, so this next step will be even less satisfying. <laughs> we'll say that WJ plus one and WJ are close. Uh, if we write this out, then by linearity, we get that this is just the difference between the inner product of the J plus one step and the J step. 
uh, if we do a bunch of linear algebra work that I didn't think we had time for, and which is honestly to me just algebra, I didn't find a lot of intuition in it, then you see that this is less than two max over these indices i of these new matrices gamma i, where the, entrance, the entries of gamma i are equal to the corresponding entry in gamma x y if the bits differ on the input. So if f if xi is not equal to yi and zero otherwise. Um, and I wish I had more intu intuition for how we got here, but going through it to me was just a lot of algebra. If, if anyone has intuition, I would love to hear. Or has, have people seen this before? I'm not sure how common this is. Okay. But still on a higher level, what, why, why are they clones? It's just that's the way it's set up, but somehow um, also like maybe why is this thing small at the end? It's gamma i. Why we, we why would we expect the spectral norm to be small? Mm -hmm. So the thing that we're gonna do is say that like this holds for all choices of gamma, and then we'll just have to exhibit some particular choice of gamma for which this is small. And yeah, so kind of the work of showing that that's small will fall to us later if we want to get a little down out of it. So this is what the STP does, optimizes the yes. STP. Yeah, model. exactly. It's exactly. almost the variables the STP. Yeah. Okay. So it's not it's not a given that these things are small. You know, no. It's just you can bound them with something that you, that yeah. you choose to be small. Exactly, yes. And, and maybe the like question of why you'd expect this quantity to be small is maybe there's like a limit to the amount of I think the very high level is there's a limit to the amount of information we can get from one call to the oracle. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure. Okay, keep going. Uh, so let's combine these things. And so these three different facts to get a bound on the number of queries that we need to apply here. So we know that WT, I'll just write this as a sum over all of the prior W0 values. Here it's just, I've expanded it and there's lots of cancellation going on. Uh, so the only thing left over on this side is the WT, if I did this correctly. And I know that this term is equal to the spectrum norm of gamma. That's the first thing that we proved. And I know that the change here is an absolute value is less than this quantity. So in the worst case, like this just is, and with this, um, we subtract this magnitude each time, t different times. So I know that like this summation or this whole thing in total is gonna to be greater than or equal to the spectral norm minus the amount that I could change each step times the number of steps that I've made t. And we know the second thing to succeed for this algorithm to succeed with probability one minus epsilon over all the inputs, I know that WT has to be greater than or less than or equal to this thing at the very end. So if I just sandwich WT between these two inequalities uh, and then solve for T here, I get this quantity. I've just moved this over to that side, factored out the, the spectral norm of gamma and then divided by this term. Uh, and I know that this holds for all of the different gammas. So I didn't say anything about the particular one that I'm using. I just said, if it satisfies these properties, then we get all of this. Uh, so this holds for all of the different choices of gamma that I can make. And the name of the game is choosing the right gamma so that this gives you a nice lower bound. Okay, so uh, if you squint at this correctly, I don't have great intuition on quantum optimization, but if you do and you squint at this correctly, then you see that this is a semi-definite program uh, where you're maximizing over gamma values. And we know that the number of queries that we're making is going to be greater than or equal to this for all choices of gamma. Uh, if you are really good with some kind of programs in convex optimization, maybe you can see that this is the dual of this SVP. I don't have that intuition. I'm not sure how to get here. This is in like ben, one of Ben Reichardt's papers, which I believe. Uh, so this is the dual of that SDP problem. I have maybe some rough intuition about why these make sense, so I want to just go through that. Uh, here, 
The rough intuition about the primal problem is that on the top, we define the CMA matrix in such a way that maybe it, like, it holds the information requirement that we need in order to tell apart X and Y when F of X is not equal to F of Y. And maybe at the bottom, this is saying the information gain, or we saw that this is the information gain that we can get per query. So if you like, believe this, then, and you do dimensional analysis, you get information requirement that we need at the end over information gain per query, and we get just the number of queries that we have. So maybe that's into some intuition about why this holds. On the bottom, um, we have this uh, the dual of this SDP, and I want to start with this constraint. So we're saying for all X and Y whose outputs differ, I need the sum over all of their bits that are different from each other. So all I such that XI is not equal to YI, such that these VXIs, these are the vectors that I'm max or minimizing over in this SDP, the sum of their inner product has to be equal to one. When are these values large? So in the objective term, we have these VXIs and these VXIs are larger values, or like the objective here is we're trying to minimize the maximum value of the sum over all of the norms, the two norms of these VXI vectors. When are these VXI vectors large? Well, they're large, if I need to make them large to satisfy the constraint, and I need to make them large to satisfy the constraint if I only uh, have a few bits where xi is not equal to yi. So for example, if I have two, if I have an x and a y and they're the same basically everywhere except on a single bit, then I need to make the corresponding vxi and vyi values larger so that their inner product is still, is still equal to one. On the other hand, if they differ in a lot of different bits, then I can kind of spread out that magnitude. If I'm forced to concentrate the magnitude, then that'll make the objective value larger here. So that's like my rough intuition for why this would help is that, yeah. Should there also be constraints in the, in the primal? Uh, so the constraints in the primal are that this is like a, I think a PSD matrix. So I call it some engine to be zero at fx. Was yeah, you're right. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, that's stuff that I did not write down. Okay. That should be here as well. You're right. Um, okay. So yeah. So we have we have quite some STP experts ah, here. Okay. So so well, I'm not one of them. <laughs> but, but maybe they they could like shed some light on like why is this blue like this primal and STP because dividing by stuff somehow that doesn't look very linear and maximization. Okay. okay. Somehow relate to, but I don't know. Just I thought know. this was so sorry. The this is the objective term, and I think there are constraints on this one. Well, well, well but the variables are the entries of gamma, no? So, well, gamma is the is the the the, the variable you optimize over. That has to be PSD. Yeah, there's some constraints on it, but like you divide by a norm of. Gamma. It's equivalent to saying maximize the operator norm of gamma subject to the constraints that each gamma i has norm at plus one. Right, and then you're no longer dividing, instead you have like n constraints, one for each of the gamma i's. And then you have to believe that uh, that you can express operator norms in SDPs. Yeah, that I'm pretty sure. Okay. But what, why, why, how do you get this one thing? Well, you know, it, it, this is sort of yeah, a uh, thing, right? You, you could multiply yeah, gamma by a thousand. It's, it's kind of normalized. Ratio. Yeah, yeah so you can normalize. It doesn't change the ratio. And now instead of dividing by the max over i of gamma i, or you put the constraint that for each i, the norm of gamma i is a model. I think about it too, like similar to, like there are two ways that you should define the maximum eigenvalue. You, you could define it as the ratio of the like, norm, the same thing here. Like the matrix, the two norm of the matrix times the vector over the two norm of the vector, or say if you just consider vectors such that their norm is one because they have the genus, then you just describe. Yeah. Thank you. This is way more fun than I thought. <laughs> I thought it'd be fun. Maybe a part back. We haven't even got through the lunch yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I will just say that this quantity, the like optimal objective value here is equal to A. And we're going to see that this is a, a query complexity of evaluating f of x. So, so far we've seen that this is a lower bound on query complexity, but I haven't shown you that, that it's an actually an upper bound yet, because it's possible there's like some other lower bound technique 
which gives a better lower bound. So actually, yeah, by duality, we know that this objective value is always going to be greater than or equal to this thing. But that doesn't actually tell us that this is the query complexity, or there is a quantum algorithm with this query complexity, because there could be a better lower bound technique. Um, but that's the thing that we'll see next, that this is the query complexity of evaluating Boolean function f on a quantum computer. And the way that we're going to build this algorithm is that we're going to assume that we have the optimal solution vxi to this dual SDP here. So we have some set of vectors vxi that satisfy each one of these constraints, and their objective value is very small. Um, OK, so exactly that. We're given a solution to the dual, and we're going to build an algorithm with query complexity equal to the objective value. The starting state here is going to be, so psi 0 is just going to be equal to cat 0, and we're going to apply two unitaries. The first unitary is input dependent, and this is going to be our oracle. I'm just writing it in a slightly different way, where pi x here is a projection matrix, um, which I will show very shortly. And then the other unitary is 2 pi minus i, Pi again is a projection matrix, so this is a unitary, and this is input independent. And I'll show briefly how what these things actually are. Okay, so the algorithm that we're going to do with this is we're going to run phase estimation on the unitary equal to this times this from our initial starting state, ket zero. And then uh, that means that we're going to estimate theta in this term, u zero equal to e to the minus i theta zero within precision one over A. And to do this, there are known results that we can like solve this using OA queries. Maybe if there's like some log factors that I didn't know here. Okay. And then after we run phase estimation, if the output is within one over A, one of our, uh, like that's our precision of zero, then we answer that F of X is equal to one. And otherwise we're gonna answer that F of X is equal to zero. Uh, question for us. Hello. Could you remind me again what the delta and the pi? Oh, yes. I haven't shown you yet, but I will. <laughs> Good question. It's this complicated structure, which is kind of gross to parse, but is very nice when analyzing this algorithm. But, and it's right here. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to consider this in two different cases. The first case that we're going to consider is when f of x is equal to 1. And we want to show, we want to exhibit a vector psi x, which is in the zero eigenphase space of u, and it has high overlap with our starting vector ket zero, which we're running phase estimation on. Uh, so sure, to, should I just ask, on yeah. the previous slide, you claimed that ket zero itself was an eigenstate of u. Yes. Is it or is it not? I think it is. Okay. Uh, am I not? Am I saying it's not here? Well, now you exhibit uh, as a vector in the zero eigenspace, which is psi x, which is only close to ket zero. That doesn't imply that ket zero itself is an eigenstate of u. Oh, I'm saying that this is in the zero eigenphase space. So its eigenvalue is one. Yes, but, but ket zero, zero itself could have this is its eigenvalue, yeah. and this is not necessarily equal to one. No, no, but why, why is cat zero an eigenstate of u? Are you going to show this? Oh, why is that equal yeah. to u? Uh, yeah, we. I wasn't planning on it, but I can show you, show you here. If you want. Um, maybe I can do this on the top. Yes, OK. So pi x is equal to this thing. If I just multiply this by cat zero, I get like this just is zero is an eigenstate of pi x because it like there's no interaction with any of these terms. There's only an interaction with this term. And then similarly here, it's so this is a span onto these psi x's, which I'm defining down here. And each one of them, when I multiply, like clearly zero or the cat zeros in the span of these psi x's because I'm also defining it like this. So that, I don't know if that's enough for proof. Mm -hmm. And then, I heard, so I know that pi x zero is equal to zero, and I know that 
delta zero is equal to some some value on plus c times ten zero. Because every time I multiply it by psi x, I pick up like one over any of x value here. And then the thing, the delta here is the span of all the psi x's. Now what was delta? Uh, delta is the span of all these psi x's, ah. which are defined down here. Sorry, I'm doing this in the wrong order to try to. to this. So is delta also, is it the projection of this path? Yeah, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then isn't the C just one? Uh because I think it would be if we didn't have this constant out, right? Yeah, but if, if delta is the projection, then it's kind of normalized, right? So then C would be either zero or one because it's a projection, because zero is an eigenstate. So I think you can you can say that C is one. But if but we always have like if this number appears just by itself. It's mm -hmm. never just cat zero by itself here. I think if it was cat zero by itself, then we would, but it's always shows up with a vector with other stuff in it. So it's cat zero and then other things. And I think because of that, it isn't. The, this constancy is not I would, Let me go back to the stuff that I am more familiar with and then we can maybe take this offline. Uh, but yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing that we have is that phi x times psi x is equal to psi x by its structure. Um, so I wrote this down here. I don't know how much I want to of this I want to go through. It's just like it's designed so that there's very nice cancellation here. Uh, in particular, like this applied to this part, like just the x size come through. This is the identity, so it doesn't matter what this vx size. Remember the vx size was the solution to the dual SDP. And then this gets like nice interaction on the eyes as well. And then there's also a nice interaction. So uh, pi x psi x is equal to psi x. And this is by the clever structure that these were both defined with. And then delta is the projection onto the span of all these psi x's such that f of x is equal to one. And this, uh, by definition, because it's the span of this is also equal to psi x. So we've satisfied the first thing, that the vector psi x is in the zero eigenphase space of u. And the second thing we want to show is that, is that psi x has high overlap with zero. So here, the absolute value squared of their inner product is equal to one over nu x. That's like, there's no interaction on these parameters. Like, uh, zero only interacts with psi x here. So that's all zeroed out. And the thing I get is one over square root of nu x, and then I square it, so this is nu x. And you can show, I don't want to show it now, that this is greater than or equal to two thirds. So there's good enough overlap in the f of x equals one case. Any questions? Or... Okay. Uh, let's analyze the case where I'm, I'm going to use a new variable y. Let's say that. The, the case where f of y is equal to zero. The goal here is that we're going to show that ket zero has small overlap with the one over a eigenphase space uh, in this case. So for analysis, we're going to consider some vectors phi y, which are equal to this thing. This has like an almost complementary structure to the psi x's. So in particular, when we take the inner product of psi x and phi y, we're going to get that this is equal to this scaling, one minus this sum. This sum is exactly the constraint we had in the SDP. That, and the constraint was that this sum has to be equal to one. So their inner product is equal to zero here. And this is like by, again, this very nice choice of structure. So like we get cancellation here and then we're subtracting instead of adding, which is why all this nice stuff happens. Uh, the second property that we have is that pi y times phi y is equal to ket zero over this mu y scaling term. Uh, and that's just because we don't get any interaction uh, down here because these are knotted. These are not yi's. So the, this, the interaction between these is always zero. So this sum gets canceled. And the only thing that we're left with is a zero one over the scaling term mu y, square root mu y. But we're going to use these two properties and apply this effective spectral gap lemma 
Uh, here, the way that we apply it is almost algebraic, um, but, but I'll, I'll go through this. So let P omega be projection onto the eigenvectors of this matrix U that we've been using before. So it's two delta minus I times two pi Y minus I with the eigenvalues E I theta for theta less than omega. If we satisfy this, so if delta phi Y is equal to zero, then the projection onto pi y of phi y the, is less than or equal to omega over two. And you can show this algebraically. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna check is that this condition holds. This was the first property that we had before, that the inner product of psi x and phi y is equal to zero. Uh, and because delta is the span of the psi axis, then this must mean that this is also equal to zero. So we satisfied this first constraint. Then the thing that we're really interested in bounding is the projection of zero onto the small eigenspace of U. That's this quantity. But by the second thing that we showed right here, we know that this, like pi y, phi y, is equal to zero times the scaling. We're going to just plug that equation in right here. And we're going to replace zero with this quantity times the scaling that we had before. So this is an like, almost algebraic use of the effect of the special gap lemma. And then we know that this quantity by this lemma is less than omega over two. And this, we can bound the scaling factor as less than or equal to A, where A was the objective value of our SDP before. Uh, and this is by the construction of the phi y's. I'm not hiding much here. It's just a very simple exercise to do it. And so we have that this is equal to a times omega. If we set omega equal to one over a, that's the like projection we care about. It's onto the eigen the like eigenvalues with phase less than one over a. Then we can get that this is less than or equal to some small constant. And this corresponds choosing omega small just means that we're solving the phase estimation problem with small precision. And that small precision is one over A, and the runtime that we need to solve it within that precision is A. So this algorithm has query complexity A, or order A. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, the, the way the dual adversary vectors was constructed was like uh, we construct this v x i's for all x right in the domain. Yes, yes, exactly. Now there is an alternate uh, way also to construct where for f inverse one inputs we construct some uis and for f inverse zero input we construct some wis. Okay. Um, does that algorithm like the 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 algorithm corresponding to those SDPs? Do that or does that also go through this phase estimation idea? Did we, do I you know that? Don't know anything about that algorithm. I'm sorry. It sounds similar to defining the psi x's for f of x just yeah. for f, just where f of x is one and phi y just where f of x is zero. So it could be that you're optimizing just those vectors instead of the vx i's that make them up. It should work out, right? Then the same thing. Yeah, I don't think so. Like it, it seems intuitive you could do something. I think the way you describe it is that's how it's done in chapter 12 of my lecture. Oh, I have, I, I, I think it again. <laughs> so is that the same? So that does it also do phase estimation? It uses phase estimation. Okay, same algorithm. Okay. But it, it avoids a spectral gap learner. Uh -huh. Or rather, it uses some of the calculations of the spectral gap level without ever stating the spectral gap level. Okay. Because I never understand the statement of the spectral gap level. <laughs> 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 Sounds better. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. So hopefully we can get to, yeah. So now that maybe you believe that this, uh, maybe you knew this before. <laughs> this was an exercise in patience. That this was um, like, Solving the dual of this SDP gives an algorithm with optimal query complexity, and that we know it's optimal by duality. So the lower bound is equal to the upper bound here. Uh, there's maybe two ways you could use this. One way is that you just look at this and intuit the optimal solution. 
I'm like, you can actually do this for f equal to or. Um, if you can do it for other functions, like I think there are many people in this room who are smarter than me, and maybe you can, and that'd be awesome. And if you'd like to talk to me, I really would love to <laughs> like work on this together. Uh, but for me, it's very difficult, and I, I'm not able to do that. Maybe the second way that you could use this is that you could, this is an SDP that we can solve numerically in fact practice for a fixed function f and for a fixed n, and we get an understanding maybe of the optimal algorithm from it. Uh, so that's the thing that we do in code. So I don't have much time left, but maybe I'll just show you what this code is. Oops. Uh, maybe while I'm doing that, I, I want to say like there, there are definitely drawbacks to using this SDP. The first one, which I've kind of hidden so far, is that the dimension of these vectors is typically quite large. It's the size of S times N, where the size of S, if we're using all bit strings, is 2 to the N. So this could be very large. And the question is, can we do better? Um, that's one issue here. The other thing is that if we... Uh, actually solve this numerically, then we're never going to be able to satisfy this constraint exactly. There's always going to be some small amount of error. So what happens if we can solve this approximately, only approximately? Notice that this is a problem for us in this algorithm because we needed this to be exactly equal to one for the inner product between these psi x's and phi y's to be equal to zero. If this isn't equal to zero, then maybe weird things can happen when we take the span of the psi x's and we no longer have the, this property that we wanted, which was that delta phi y is equal to zero, or even that it's small. Like Even if there's an arbitrarily small error here, it's possible in taking the span, something weird happens, and then we can't bound this quantity. Uh, so the work that we do in this paper is showing actually like we can do this thing, and that requires like proving an approximate version of the spectral gap limit, and then replacing delta with another unitary here. That makes this work. Uh, and I won't go into it more than that, but you can still get bounds on that to answer this question. Like if we can solve this approximately, then we can still satisfy the constraint and get a nice algorithm from it. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just actually finish here while I'm still on this. So that's this result. Uh, and we can like state exactly the amount of error that we're able to tolerate. So how much of these constraints can be quantified, like if we define this matrix M and we look at the singular values of it, and then we know that the difference between these is small enough, uh, and we satisfy this other constraint, then there is a quantum algorithm for F with the right query complexity in the right space still. Uh, the question, of course, is like, are these reasonable assumptions on the error? We check that numerically by solving an SDP in practice. And solving one of these SDPs and seeing if our solution to the SDP that we came to numerically actually satisfies these error constraints. And if we plot this, the, both of these are log scale, so it kind of looks weird. Uh, this is the actual error that we get in our numerical solutions, and this is the allowed error. This is a nasty quantity. <laughs> you can kind of get a hint at here. Then uh, in everything that we tried, it's on the right side or the, the correct side of this line. The allowed error is greater than or equal to the actual error that we have. So these are reasonable constraints and maybe this like theorem is useful in practice. Um, so that, that was the like robust side of these results. If we violate these constraints, then we can still, or like we, it's okay up to some threshold on the error and that error is satisfied in practice. The second thing that we do is answer the first question, which is what if we want to make these vectors smaller? So we say, uh, we'll define some new quantity kappa, which is the rank of the VXIs. Those are the solutions, to the SDPs. If there is a quantum algorithm for this function with query, oh, then there is a quantum algorithm with the right query complexity and its space is now log n times kappa. In the worst case, kappa is still the number of VXIs, uh, which would be like, the size of S times N. So this like doesn't hurt us in the worst case. But for example, if we have the, the number of X's such that F of X equals one or the number of X's such that F of X equals zero is some polynomial value, then we definitely know that the number of these is less than N. So the rank of these also has to be less than N. And we can get an algorithm with log capital N, little N space 
which is better. And this is poly log n capital N if capital N is poly polynomial in N. So for example, for or and and or other functions where there just aren't that many inputs that evaluate to f of x equals one or f of x equals zero, then um, this would be helpful. And we hypothesize that, or conjecture that there are some cases where the rank of these VXIs could be even smaller, but we weren't able to find any of them in practice because it's very hard to reason about these VXIs. Um, yeah, let me jump to these. On my computer, and hopefully I can like show you this code and the working demonstration of it. Hopefully. So I'll stop sharing here. And I'll join. Okay. So this is a collab notebook. Let me... Okay. So I'm just going to run all of this at once and then we can walk through it. We wrote some code and wrote it and put it into PyPy so you can install it in Python via pip. This is actually way easier than I thought it would be, which is kind of very sketchy. You can kind of upload whatever package you want to here. So it just says we didn't. Mean to do anything? <laughs> Is there any viruses in it? It wasn't intentional. <laughs> um, we're just going to import a few packages, and then I'll like demonstrate how you could use this code. So here we're going to explicitly define arrays e and d. E is or d is going to be the domain the input to our function f. So here it's zero 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 one one zero and one one, and e is just the corresponding output value of f of x. So for example, we could just try. Uh, the OR function here, which is equal to this. If we run this code, oh, I think stuff is running at the end of it. Okay. Uh, before it was parity. The query complexity of parity, even on quantum computer, is still two. It's still n. You need to look at everything, or order n. Uh, and that's what you get out of here. So the query complexity in this case is correct. And then it like tells you how long it took to solve and the number of iterations of the SDP. So are you doing parity or the OR function here? Uh, the, when I ran it before, it was on, sorry, XOR function. The, 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 the query complexity of two bit XOR is one on the quantum computer, not two. Right. Order. <laughs> Would you believe me that? <laughs> the order. <laughs> <laughs> like all of this is up to some constant factor. So what you're probably computing here is the value A, right? The answer is Yes. And am. then the query yeah. complexity value is sort of like half times A. Right. Yes. Right. And it makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Keeping me honest. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. Maybe I ran so we can run this again on OR and we get the square of N, which is the effective value of the SDP. Uh, maybe you don't want to write all this out by hand. So we wrote some kind of functions which allow you to construct these or like construct these as you go. So this function gets all binary strings and this one evaluates or. Uh, so we can just check it for n equals one, this is the right thing. And zero one for n equals two, this is also the right thing. And it's doing a square root of n here, which is square, which is 1.414. Uh, same thing here on three, bits and four bits and five bits. And each time this is the square root of the corresponding number. Uh, maybe you don't recognize that offhand or maybe it's some other value. So we make it very easy to plot this. Here we're plotting the query complexities that we got up here for different values of n for this function against square root n. And there's only one line because it's the same value here. Uh, the square root complexity is exactly n and this lines up with our theoretical results. Uh, if you look at the runtime to find this, this is exponential, which makes sense because the size of our input strings is growing very quickly. That's not so good. Maybe you know something about your function and you know what the worst case inputs to it are. So for example, for OR, we know that the worst case inputs here, the ones that are difficult to tell apart, are the strings that have a single one in it or no ones in it. So if you restrict your set S to just those strings and then you run this again, we can run this for much larger values of n all the way up to like 10, which makes sense because the size of our s is smaller. 
Uh, and here, these are just all bit strings with a single one in them or no one in them. And we can compute the query complexity here again. If we do that and we plot it, it's again equal to square root n. So what's nice about this is that, that of course, this is slow because the number of constraints grows exponentially with your size of your s. But if you know something about your worst case inputs, then you don't need to look at all of them. You can look at fewer of them, in which case the runtime isn't quite as bad as it was before. So you, you can, if you know that this is more helpful if you know what your worst case inputs look like. Uh, we also make it easy to specify a custom function. So if you want your function to just be, let's say the first bit here, and you can run this, uh, the query complexity as we know should just be one in this case which is exactly what we get uh, here. So if we plot, this is n, this is square root n, and this is the query complexity that we got. It's just one a uniform value. Maybe you specify another uh, thing that you care about. So this could be a random um, function. So it's just returning a random value for f of x. This, of course, will vary depending on what your query complexity is here, uh, because it's almost the same value. That's fine. Um, and if you specify what this is and you can visualize its complexity, you should get something that's wonky because I'm just doing a random outputs here. Maybe you could specify something else like parity. If you run this again, then you get just the n value. And now that's hidden because the complexity of mine is under n. Cool. Okay, that's exactly eleven. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>